company. Oh, sorry. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our show tonight. I can see there's lots of people already here, so welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Tuesday, the 28th of July, 2020. So if you're watching now, you're watching live. If it's not Tuesday, the 28th of July, you're watching the replay, and that's perfectly fine. So we're doing uh, part two of Lessons from Grandma. If you remember last week we talked about working and what to do if you didn't have work, how you could find work, how families could pull together, all things that even the little children can do in a family to help when times are tough. This week we're going to talk about eating when money is really, really tight and how that's something I know about. It's something that I'm pretty good at and I'm probably not the best. There are probably people out there that do better than me. But when disaster struck, we literally, you know, I had to write my shopping list out with the prices next to it. And if it was even one cent over, and in those days we still had copper coins, if it was just one cent over, something had to go. That's how tight our budget was back then. Thank goodness it's eased up a bit with um, a lot of hard work. It's eased up a bit and we're not quite so strict. I don't have to be quite so pedantic about the price of things. But right now, our world's topsy-turvy. Our normal isn't normal. So from day to day, we don't know what's going to happen in the world. And I was reading this morning, does my head in. Now, bear in mind that economics is something I absolutely love and I did study for a while. Right now, I just want to take all those experts and whack them into the next century and say, you're all fools. But anyway, I can't do that. So I can just tell you how we're going to survive the ups and downs of our economy here in Australia at the moment, the ups and downs of the economy if you're in the UK, the USA, if you're in South Africa, if you are in Poland, New Zealand, Japan, where up Canada, where else have we got Portugal? We're all in the same boat, folks. Wherever we live, the economy is has tanked. It's just, you know, it's just fallen in a heap for all manner of reasons. So we need to pull up our big girl bloomers or our big boy bloomers, riches, whatever, and think about how we can survive on what we have, but not just survive, but thrive, because that's the difference between living a good life on a tight budget and being miserable. And there's absolutely no need to be miserable on a tight budget, even a really tight budget. You can find something to be happy about, something to be thankful for, something to give you a bit of joy in your life. So that's what I'm going to talk about, how we can eat on a tight budget when money is really tight. Now, let me just bring up my notes, guys, because oh, nearly gave you the wrong one. Um, I need them so that I can keep track of what I'm going to say to you. One of the biggest things that saved us way back when we had two little boys and a baby on the way and a half a house and no job and we didn't qualify for unemployment benefits and we thought our lives were just going to fall apart. One of the biggest things that saved us was having a garden. Now, back then I thought it was the most amazing garden in the world. I look at it, I think back on it now and look at what I have now and I'm Phew. It was nothing, but it saved us. It meant that we had some fresh food that we didn't have to buy. And when you have little people in the house, you've got to feed them. You've got to feed them veggies and fruits. So growing even a little bit that I didn't have to buy freed up money in the budget. Back during the Great Depression, if a family was permanently based somewhere, they grew as much as they could. It might have been in the ground. It might have been in old boots. It could have been in old wheelbarrows, anything, containers, whatever they could find. They filled with dirt. 
they planted the seeds and they looked after them because that was food in their bellies and that meant more money in their pockets. And if they didn't have money, it meant they could eat. So whilst we here in Australia aren't quite to that stage yet, it could happen. It could happen quite easily that there will be families who will have the bills to pay. They'll have to pay the mortgage or the rent to give a roof over their head. The power, whatever, they may not have the money to buy food or to buy enough food. So grow what you can. Just a little bit. Every little bit helps. And you don't need to be a fantastic gardener to grow anything. You don't need to have green thumbs. You don't need to be a budding farmer. You can grow if you pay attention and grow herbs. And I know that's the same old, same old. And people say, oh, grow your own herbs. But if you use garlic, if you use parsley, if you use basil, rosemary, oregano, mint. chives, mint, they are all things that are really easy to grow. They can grow in the ground. They can grow in pots. They can grow in ice cream containers with holes in the bottom. They can grow in, I was going to say, the egg containers. Egg cartons, yeah. They can grow in the plastic meat trays. They will grow as long as you tend them and you just look after them, put them somewhere sunny and keep them watered, not soaked, just watered. And they will grow for you. And that's things you don't have to buy. Now, if you don't like to use them fresh all the time, they are all things that also dry really easily and no special equipment needed. Rosemary, cut it off, tighten bunches, hang it upside down, hang it um, near the heater, over a heat event this time of year if you've got them, ducted heating, the air will blow up and dry. A really good place, this is going to sound weird, a really good place for drying herbs is on a... Um, cake rack with legs if you've got a folding cake rack on top of the fridge put it towards the back of the fridge put your herbs on it and the hot air coming up from the back of the fridge will help to dry those herbs and dry them really quickly if you have a wood heater like we have just plonk them on the top of that and turn them over a couple of times a day or so and they're dry you don't need special equipment to dry your herbs put them in the oven if you've been using the oven turn it off pop them in, let the residual heat dry them. No special equipment required. And they are things you can cross off your shopping list which will free up money in your grocery budget so you might be able to buy extra flour or extra sugar or extra butter or, or extra the tin eggs tams. or the Tim Tams. No, Tim Tams aren't essential. You can make Tim Tams. No. Okay. So, you know, you don't need a lot of space. And you don't need a lot of um, fancy containers or anything to do those things. If you're worried about fertilising them, rinse out milk cartons, pour those over the top of them before you put the milk carton in the recycle bin. Soak some tea bags and or some coffee grounds in some water and strain it and pour the water over them and feed them that. You can mince up your veggie peelings, whiz them up really fine and dig those straight into the dirt and that will feed them and keep them. You don't need to buy the fertilisers then. All sorts of things you can do. Banana peels, chopped up banana peels. Chop them up really fine. If you put them in the food processor, sort of tear them up, put them in the food processor and give them a good whiz and they come out like grated carrot, dig those into your garden bed. Great fertiliser and it's free. Doesn't take you long to do that. Dig it into the pots. Pots especially need lots of nutrients and lots of watering. So just be aware of those things. But you don't even need pots. And I know we've talked about this before, but if you have a whole heap of um, green shopping bags, you know, the um, Aldi or Coles cloth bags, they make perfect planters and they're portable. You can move them. In this time of year when there's not a lot of sun, you can move them around to follow the sun. They have good things to do. Learn to grow just a few things and it will save you a fortune. And I know it's the same old, same old. You can, she says this all the time. But it's true, folks. Just a couple of things. It doesn't have to be a big garden and you don't need a lot of space. 
and it will save you a small fortune. Now, most of Australia lives in cities. So this, this next one, well, it sort of helps us a little bit because we have friends who do this. But if you're definitely if you're in the country, nothing wrong with hunting. The deer, um, rabbits are plentiful, especially here in Victoria. And if you are a licensed hunter, you've got a license for your gun or your bow hunters do a lot of deer hunting. Free meat, folks. It's hard to do when you're in the city, but it works. It's free meat. The other thing we can do, though, and anyone can do this, you don't have to be particularly talented to do this either, is fish. Go fishing. It's an outing. doesn't cost you much. You do not need fancy equipment to go fishing. You can get a $10 fishing rod from Kmart with a little reel on it. Make up some bread and water dough is a really good bait. Go fishing. Find a lake. Go down the coast, local beach, do some fishing. Fish for, you know, fresh fish. Have you seen the price of fresh fish lately? That's hard to say, fresh fish lately. It's exorbitant. But if you catch it, it's free food. So learn to fish or even better, make friends with someone who knows how to fish and barter with them. You're bound to have something that they need. They've got the fish to a trade. Again, it frees up the cash in your pocket so that you don't have to um, worry about it and it gives you that flexibility. Something that I got in trouble for telling you about a while back, I got a couple of really nasty, um, um, very cross, nasty emails about this, but foraging, nothing wrong with with foraging, if you can find mushrooms on your walk and, okay, learn your mushrooms because like oils ain't oils, mushrooms ain't always mushrooms, but learn which ones are edible, find them, pick them. Mushrooms are $10.99 a kilo this week. You can get them for free while you're exercising. Why not? Mushrooms. Um, look for fruit. If you're walking through parks and things, Check out the trees and see which ones are fruit trees and then make a note of them and go back when the fruit's ripe and pick it. Foraging is um, it used to be, um, it used to be that you were thought to be really, really desperately poor if you were foraging for food, but these days it's quite trendy. It, it's quite there's actually tours you can do tours to learn how to guided tours to learn how to forage and the best best places to go in your suburbs is it like dumpster diving it's better than dumpster diving don't be cheeky Oi. but foraging now i got into trouble because we back onto nature reserve at our back other side of our back fence nature reserve but all along our street just about every backyard had some sort of fruit tree in it. The fruit that hangs over those the back fences onto the reserve, you can pick it, okay? If it's ripe and it's there and as long as it's not on in the per person's backyard, you can pick that fruit and use it. So oranges, limes, mandarins, um, lemons, are all growing, apples, all growing along our reserve, different times of the year, plums, they are all ready to be picked, free fruit. So you can eat it, you can preserve it, you can share it with your neighbours, do a trade again with something. But foraging is now trendy. So if you become an expert forager... <laughs> People are going to think you're amazing, but it gives you free food, folks. It gives you free food. So it's another thing to do. And the whole family can do it. So it's another thing where the family can pull together. So even the little people take the tinies on with you and teach them what's good and what's not good. 
so that they learn these things. Um, when you have a lot of things, gardens producing, or there's been a really big sale at the market or the fruit and veg shop or whatever, or you've traded something for, you know, buckets of tomatoes, you need to know how to preserve them. So you need to know how to freeze them or dry them or bottle them or pressure can them. Um, freeze, dry, bottle, pressure can. Good ways of preserving food for long term and for the winter or for the next green, whatever, for when you need it. So even if you think you don't need to be an extreme prepper to do this sort of stuff. I would never have thought my mother was an extreme prepper. She thought, Grandma, no, Grandma would. But she always bottled. She had the Fowler's for cola bottles with the lids and the rings and the clips. And she used her pressure cooker. She used a big old Fowler's stovetop one. And she used a great big stock pot. And whatever there was, it was plentiful fruit wise, we bottled it. It was tomatoes, we bottled it. We did beans, we did all sorts of things. We did apricots, peaches, pineapple. I can remember one Saturday, uh, one Saturday night, we actually had friends for dinner. I must have been 17 or 18, I suppose, at the time. We had friends come for dinner. So mum, after dinner, mum set us all up in the kitchen, gave us all a job. We had boxes, we had about four boxes of pineapples that needed to be um, bottled. So someone had to chop the tops off, someone else had to do the peeling, someone else had to do the coring, someone else had to do the chopping, someone else had to make the syrup, someone else had to stack them in the jars. She had us all working <laughs> in a production line to preserve this pineapple for her. And it was, I think, one of the best nights. I have friends that still talk about that night. To learn to preserve things. It's not difficult. Jam is a way of preserving fruit. If you don't eat a lot of jam, still make it because it's a really good thing to barter or you can sell it. Um, freezing things, drying things. You, again, you don't need a lot of fancy equipment for these um, to do these methods of preserving. They're easy things to do and they are what... Um, oh, stinging needles, sorry. Um, I'll be back to you in a minute. They're easy things to do. No special equipment required. And these days, I look, a little every day. If I'm making jam, I might only have two kilos of fruit. So that's, you know, five or six bottles of jam. And I can do that while the tea is cooking. It, it, you don't need to spend days and weeks preserving anymore. Do small batches often. It's not as tiring and you don't lose the enthusiasm of <laughs> your small batches often. It works really, really well. Okay. Now, we, we touched on this last week, but um, no waste. Eating everything, you know. These days where we sort of um, will put the peelings out to the worm farm or the chickens or something. Step it back a bit and remember, you can eat those. I know that um, there used to be a hotel in um, the city here in Melbourne that charged an absolutely outrageous amount of potato skins. Now, when they say potato skins, they were literally the potato peelings and they had deep fried them. They put them in a little bowl and it was just like a little rice bowl, little rice bowl with some sour cream and some chivy things on the side. But they were literally just the potato skins that they were selling from the potatoes they had peeled for their meals. These days, um, you can get potato skins all over the place, but they're not the same. These were literally just the potato peelings from well-scrubbed potatoes. They didn't waste them. Don't peel your pumpkin. Pumpkin peel cooks up really well. If you're going to mash it, it'll mash. It's really nice roasted. 
don't want to eat it, fine. But don't, I don't peel pumpkin very often unless it's the really thick, ugly bits of the pumpkin. We just eat the peel. We don't waste it. Apple cores and apple peels were boiled to make juice or jelly, apple jelly. They weren't thrown away. Orange peels were dried. The oranges were zested and the zest was dried to be used in cooking. The orange peels were dried and used as fire lighters or to go into pomanders to um, repel silverfish and moths and things or to make the closets smell nice. Nothing was wasted. I'm sure you all remember a grandma or a great-grandma or an auntie or someone that saved the butter wrappers in the freezer for greasing the tin. You do it. I do that. That's exactly right. Don't waste the butter wrapper. And, in fact, depending on what it is, I might not even grease it. I usually just use it as a liner, spread it out, put it in the tin and use it as a liner. It works really well. Don't waste the thing. We joke about balls of string and drawers of rubber bands and all that sort of thing. But nothing was wasted. Everything was viewed as being useful. And so everything was sour cream. If you had cream and it went sour, it was used in baking. It wasn't thrown away. Um, same with yogurt. You know, although yogurt was probably a treat and a rare treat at that. I've broken up all over me. Sorry, guys. Um, a rare treat at that, but it wasn't wasted. The whey from butter, in making butter, the whey from the butter or the buttermilk was used in baking. It wasn't wasted. We don't waste anything for the stock pot. We make stock with our veggie peelings and our bones and the leftover chicken skin and whatever all goes into the stock pot. Nothing is wasted. Um, I have a recipe, and I can't remember whether I told you about this or not, I have a recipe, we just call them bread fritters. And it is literally the ends of the bread, the crusts of the ends of the bread. I save them up until I have a few, as many as I think look enough. I put them into a bowl, pour over some boiling water and let them turn to mush. Then I add grated onion, a pinch of herbs, a beaten egg, a tablespoon, about a tablespoon of plain flour, Stir it all up and cook them like fritters or pancakes in hot oil. And we have those with gravy. They are really good. It's a really cheap meal. If you don't have money to uh, buy meat, you don't have money to buy chicken, you need to feed someone, bread fritters are really, really nice. They go well with veggies then if you've got veggies. But with gravy, really nice. And gravy is really easy to make. You don't need to spend a fortune on gray box. Gravy is just pan dripping and some flour browned together with a little water added or stock added and stirred up. It's easy to do. Now, I can tell you if you go to our website, so cheapcakesclub.net, go to our website, not only will we not only will you be going to a new website because I've turned it live this afternoon, late this afternoon, but there's actually um, one of the articles on the homepage is about gravy, different types of gravy that you can make. So just popped into my head when I was talking about gravy. Okay. Um, this one's a tough one for me because it just doesn't appeal, but all of the animal was used. So... The hide was used or the fur was used to make clothes or shoes or furnishings or belts or whatever. Um, offal was often a feature of diets, meals, menus. Now, I'm not a fan of kidneys. I don't like lamb's fry. I yuck, yuck. try it. I'm... No, in this instance, I would probably, I'd have to be really hungry because I just don't like it. But nothing was wasted. Now, when I, you know, used to buy a half a cow at a time, they would always ask me if I wanted bits and pieces and I'd say no or chop them up and I'd put them in the dog bone bag and give them to my cousin for her dog. But 
there's heaps of recipes for those sorts of things. And my mother loved lamb spry and onions, didn't she? she grandma, oh. if we went out and there was lamb spry and onions on the um, menu somewhere, my mum was in heaven. She just loved it. I don't like it at all. But nothing was wasted. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, chicken feet. Even chicken feet were used. Now, I know they're a delicacy in some Asian dishes, but probably here in Australia, mostly, they were just added to the stock pot. They added flavour. They added a bit of fat so, to the stock pot. They didn't eat them, darling. They just then strained it out. Yeah, but nothing was wasted. So, yeah. Now, we all know the saying, cheese, cheese makes everything good. If you ask my boys, cheese, cheese makes anything good, even if it's awful, cheese makes anything good. Well, back in the day, cheese was expensive but hard to make too. But bacon, a little bit of bacon or a little bit of bacon fat for the flavouring added to something really simple would make it into something much more um, uh, gourmet or luxurious. So a little bit of bacon added flavour and it was added to all sorts of things, to beans, to soups, to stews, to casseroles, to the fry pan if you're frying eggs or um, bread. I have to be honest with that, I love fried bread. A um, little bit of bacon. It only went just a tiny little bit. It didn't need a lot. You didn't actually need to use the bacon. It was just the fat that was given the flavour to things. It wasn't wasted and it um, didn't cost much. So these days when you buy bacon, it's oh, so many different types these days. When you buy bacon, I always cut the rind off. Don't like the rind. Cut the rind off. But it has a fair, and I cut a, as much of the fat off as I possibly can too because I'm not a fan of fat. But that is really good. Now, that can be rendered down and kept to use for cooking or you can just chop it up and add it to whatever you're baking, frying, making, and it doesn't get wasted. Okay. Oh, sorry, guys, let me see. Here we go. I'm just going to check some comments. Sorry, folks, because there's a lot here. Maureen picked olives from the tree in a local park. Well done. Stinging nettles, don't get stung by them because they hurt. Um, you can, um, they make soup, they make tea. Stinging nettles are um, a really good, um, if the juice out of them is good for cuts and things too. Um, yes, lemons on the nature strip. There's a house a couple of streets over and they have this massive lemon tree and it overhangs onto the footpath by uh, five or six, uh, easily five or six feet and the branches are really heavy and they always put a sign, you know, help yourself to the lemons on the ones that are hanging over the um, footpath because they just can't use them themselves. I think that's really nice. And there's another house around the corner does the same thing with a plum tree. Um, so in the few weeks leading up, they'll go, the plums are coming. The plums are nearly ripe. Another couple of days, the plums, they've got little signs that they put out the front. Plums are ready. Help yourself. It's really quite cute. So if you're out for a walk, you can carry a bag and help yourself with some plums. Um, ooh. Oh, Kathleen does pumpkin skin chips with sweet chilli and sour cream. Oh, oh that would be good. Mm. Yeah, I'm not even. I like pate too, but I tend to go the vegetarian versions, Kathleen. Outback six. My mother always cooked from scratch and used up everything. She had 10 children and a hungry husband to feed, so she... Probably never had waste anyway. There was never leftovers. Okay, so eating when money is tight just means we need to be 
we need to not think like money's not tight, like we can just go to the supermarket whenever we like because we can't. So we need to think about what we've got, which brings me back to ingredients. So we've got flour, we've got sugar, we've got butter, we've got eggs, we've got oil, a few herbs and spices, some dried fruits. Ooh, we can make heaps and heaps of things with those, just those basic ingredients. We'll make lots of things. So keeping ingredients can also keep you well fed. Um, sharing. Uh, I've mentioned bartering or trading a couple of times. If you have an abundance of something and someone else is looking for it and they have something you need, work out a trade. Now, it doesn't have to be a food for food, whatever. You might have spare yeast. Yeast has been in short supply. So if you've got a couple of spare packets of yeast that you know you won't use in the next 12 months and someone's looking for yeast and they have fabric and you need fabric and they need yeast, work out a trade. Be fair with the value, but work out a trade. You don't need to, to swap fabric for fabric or whatever, you know, barter. Work out what you need, work out what they have that you need, what do you have that they need, do the trade, work out the trade, do the barter. Pesto. Um, okay, so, Okay, so Snoopy, is it Snoopy Doo? Yep, Snoopy Doo. Stinging nettles are great in the pesto stir fry soup. If you've got a recipe for pesto, I would be really interested in that. That would really, really, oh, sounds really good. All right. Often when, when money's tight, you sort of lose your imagination when it comes to, to food and you think, oh, you can't, you can't have something because it's seemingly extravagant. But, again, if you've got the ingredients and you're not having to spend money on extra things, you know, does it hurt to have scones instead of bread? No. Does it hurt to have pancakes occasionally instead of bread? No. Uses the same basic ingredients. You've already got them on hand. It lifts your mood. It makes you feel better. You don't feel like you're being deprived. You know, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the um, uh, rock soup, stone soup story, kids' story. We don't need to have stone soup. You know, and soup is pretty much just boiled veggies and water is soup. But flavour it up with different things. Use stock to make it. It makes it better. If you're doing um, doing a casserole, add a little extra water to it so it's a bit thinner, make it a thinner gravy and make some flour dumplings and put on the top of them. Put on the top of the casserole while well, just about half an hour before it cooks now, dumplings are easy. It's pretty much just milk, flour, and a little bit of butter rubbed in to make a dough, and you pull it into pieces. This is how I do it anyway. Pull it into pieces, drop it into the top of the boiling casserole or stew pot, put the lid on, and let it cook for about half an hour. It's something a little more, I don't know, it's fancier. It's not just stew. So it's not as boring. You don't feel as deprived because that um, feeling, feeling deprived can be a real downer and you don't want that to happen. So you need to keep thinking of things that are different and new to get you through. Okay. Um, meals were cooked from scratch. No, if you've got no money, you can't afford to eat out. You can't afford to take away. I don't care how many times McDonald's off a free delivery from their app, you can't afford it. So you're going to cook from scratch. But do fake away. We do pizzas on Thursday nights. Homemade hamburgers. Now, the price of oh, hamburgers is about $15 now for a hamburger with a lot, I think. Last mm -hmm. time I checked, I was $15 for one, for one. So for $15, I can probably make two meals of hamburgers for my family easily. 
make two full meals of hamburgers for my family with the rolls, the meat patties, thrown in eggs and cheese. I'd even put pineapple on them for that, for that price. So you can do fake away. Potatoes can make chips or wedges really easily as opposed to paying about $8 a kilo for them from the supermarket. Potatoes, about a dollar a kilo. Take off the peel, so it probably costs about $1.20 for a kilo of wedges. Really easy to do yourself at home. And they don't take any longer to cook than they do buying the frozen ones. Um, ah, Barb's stone soup story. Yeah, we've got it packed away in the kids' book. They liked it too. Um, oh, Maureen, can I? Oh, I can't come to your house for morning tea. Maureen's making yo yo's. That's because you have an oven that works. Um, night, Barb. All right. So, check your market. Now, we live in, I live in Melbourne, so my lot of favourite fruit shops closed. But I still have a couple of markets that I can, well, in normal times can get to. Doing your market shopping just before closing, starting about three quarters of an hour before closing time on the weekend or the last day, most markets will only go for a couple of days. You pick up huge, great bargains. And that's a really good way to shop because you can pick those up. You've got enough for yourself and you've got more to either sell to friends, family, neighbours or trade with friends, family, neighbours or use them to make something that you can sell, pickles, relishes, jams, whatever, fruit leathers, all sorts of things. So knowing when your markets close is a really, really good thing. Like the Dandenong Market, for instance, is open on a Tuesday. So if you go late Tuesday afternoon, about 2.30, 3 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, it's starting to wind down. It's a good time to go and snap up those um, fruit and veg bargains. Now you need to be a bit flexible if you're going to do that because you've got to take what they've got. Um, but most of the storeholders will be happy to do a deal with you too. So, yeah. Shop once. Don't shop every day. Don't, well, right now in Melbourne, most of us can't or shouldn't, but don't get into the habit of shopping every day. Shop once, write a list, take it with you, get what's on the list to go home. Have a set shopping day. It might be Thursday, Friday, Sunday, whatever day. Have a set shopping day. That's when you go shopping. You've got your list, you get what's on the list, you come home. If you've forgotten something, put it on the list for the next week. Don't go back to the shops because chances are you'll go back for that one thing on the list and come out with three or four other things that weren't on the list that you didn't really need, didn't really want, cost you money. So get it and you've got your time and your petrol or your energy for walking to the shops or the bus or whatever to add into the cost. So just get into the habit of shopping once, whether it be once a week, once a fortnight, once a month. Get into that habit and stick to it. Honestly, switching to monthly shopping, best thing I ever did. Okay. Now. Oh. Choose things that are inexpensive for your meals. So meat is expensive. Um, dairy is expensive. Uh, where pretty much eggs, pasta, potatoes, fruit and veg is relatively cheap compared to the cost of meat when you work out what you get value for money. So... I'm not saying give up meat or chicken or fish. I'm just saying try to choose cheaper cuts. Watch the portion sizes. Remember, a piece of meat, size of the palm of your hand, and that's pretty much the size of the palm of my hand. I have huge hands. Piece of meat, so 180 to 200 grams of piece of meat. The chicken, 
meat or chicken will do that, um, is more than enough. Uh, what's your portion control? Then when you're doing your fruit and veg, look at, compare the price per kilo. So this is where your unit pricing comes in between fresh and frozen. So your frozen veggies, your frozen beans, frozen peas, frozen corn, frozen cauliflower, broccoli, carrots, whatever, are just as nutritious as fresh. Often they're cheaper per kilo. So, yes, you do need the freezer room to store them, but you've got to have the fridge room to store the other veg anyway, so it's a trade-off. But they're often cheaper. And, of course, they don't go off. So if you only use a half a head of broccoli, which is about probably a third of a packet, maybe a half a packet, the rest of it's going to keep in the freezer. It's not going to go yellow in the bottom of the fridge. You're not going to be throwing that money in the bin. So look at those things and do that comparing. I did a lot of that. Um, I compared dried peas and dried beans and dried corn and dried carrots to the tinned to the fresh, to the frozen, and chose the cheapest for us way back when because money was tight. If money's really tight, that's what you have to do. Does it take time? Yes, it takes you two minutes at most to do that quick comparison. It's not difficult. You can do it. None of this is rocket science. You don't need to be brilliant to do any of this. You just need to want to do it. So... Um, Well done, Outback 6. Yeah, unit pricing is the way to shop. Is the way to shop, exactly. Even with sales things, because often um, something will be on sale. For instance, we'll go back to Tim Tams, not essential, but, you know, Tim Tams, last week at Coles, two packets for $6. Same size packet in Aldi was $2.49. So under $5 for two packet. Know, know your unit pricing. Know your shopping. Keep your price books up to date so that you know where the cheapest, um, cheapest places are to shop for what you need. And if that means that you need to go to two or three shops, then you need to go to two or three shops, folks. Shopping is a chore, not a recreational habit. We need to stop and think of shopping as being part of our job, part of our job as homemakers, part of our job as stewards of our finances. Shopping is a part of our job. It's not a, it's not a fun thing. It's not a hobby. It's not, you know, a recreational activity. It's a job. So if we need to go to Aldi, then Coles, then the Greengrocers, then the Butcher and then Woolworths, that's what we have to do. We might need to stop at IGA or Foodworks on the way home. That's what we need to do. If you have a tight budget, you need to be flexible enough to do those things. Now, for most of us, we have at least two, if not more, supermarkets within two or three kilometres of where we live. Now, if you're rural then it's a little different. If you live in the inner city, you might have to come out to the suburbs to do your shopping. But that's what you do. You, you live where you live, so you make the changes, you adapt to be able to do the things you need to do to eat well on a tight budget. You need to allocate. Think of shopping as a job. You allocate the time to do it. You're not just going to zip down the coals and do the shopping. You are going to do the shopping. It will take you time. Now, I like to be able to zip in and zip out, and these days I can because I have my list. I know where everything is in the shop. I know what I need. I go zip, bang, 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 bang. Skip aisles, entire rows, two and three and four at a time that have nothing in them that I want. Skip them. I don't go down them. Go to the checkout, get out and go home. Go to the next store. Now, if you live close to a major shopping centre, then chances are you have at least two supermarkets in that centre 
that will give you those alternatives. Now, I know we have um, the Glen has Aldi, Woolworths and Coles. So that's the three majors at the Glen Shopping Centre. So within one shopping centre, I could do all three supermarkets without having to drive any, any further. So plan your shopping. It's a chore. Think of it as a job that you have to do and tackle it as efficiently as you can. Um, off my soapbox now, sorry. Not time. Okay. One of my dreams is to have a house cow because I really want milk, I really want cream, I really want to be able to make hard cheeses and, and manure. But we own manure so we can do fertiliser, yeah. But we live in suburbia, so I can't have a house cow. We can have chickens. We need chickens. So, you know, they would be a great asset. If you can have, the, have chickens and you eat a lot of eggs, why not? If you... Don't eat a lot of eggs and you can have chickens. You can sell the eggs. You can barter the eggs for what you do need, you know. Eggs, eggs are like gold in currency, in barter currency. So especially, you know, homegrown eggs are like gold. So if you can have do those sorts of things, it's another thing you cross off the shopping list. So it frees up more money to buy what you need. Um In the olden days, I think you used to hear about um, women that would save the egg money and it would pay for Christmas or it would pay for the new dining room table or whatever. They saved their egg money. It was um, a wealth creator for them. They, they had the eggs. They didn't cost anything for them to produce because those chickens didn't get a lot of expensive chicken feed like we have these days. They got fed the grasses and the weeds and the pickings from the garden and whatever, the veggie peelings and things, maybe a handful of grain every now and then. So the eggs were pretty much free. They used what they needed and were able to sell the rest. And the egg money was currency to them. It created, it gave them the luxuries in life. So think about that. Um, um, hi, everyone. Oh. I hope you had a happy birthday, six. That's a milestone going to grade one next year. Okay. And, you know, don't discount the soup pot or the stew pot. Soup is a really cheap meal. Ignore the recipes you see on MasterChef, My Kitchen Rules, whatever. Go for nice, simple, um, what a peasant food. That makes it sound awful, but it is good. It's full of body and goodness and, and it's delicious and it's cheap. So, you know, Look at those sorts of soups. Now, I will toss in a lamb shank that I've cut off a leg of lamb into a soup pot. These days I only put one in. I used to put two or three, but they're a bit expensive, so I always portion them out. Um, celery, onion, carrot, potato, I'll do split peas or lentils or dried beans, whatever I've got. Um, celery leaves are also good in soup, guys. I never throw out the celery leaves. They get chopped up and frozen and put in the soup pot and the casserole pots. Um, what else? Rice, pasta. Add those things to your soup to bulk it out. Water or stock. I usually have stock in the freezer, so I can use stock. It makes a really good soup. If you don't have a meat bone to put into it, make it vegetable soup. Leave out the potato, add some macaroni or some small shell pasta or break up some spaghetti and put into it. 
and some tomatoes, whether they're fresh or tinned, diced tomatoes, and make it vegetable soup. If you want to be really, 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 really easy soup, tin of tomato soup and a packet of frozen mixed veg. Throw in some parsley. And if you've got some celery, some celery, cook it all up till the veg is soft and you have a really quick tomato and vegetable soup. Now, it's not necessarily the most frugal meal, but it's quick and it's reasonably tasty and you don't need any special ingredients for it. So, okay. I remember um, mum telling us that they had soup twice a day every day, soup for lunch, soup for tea. They always had soup and a hot meal at lunchtime. They had soup and a light, lighter hot meal at tea time because my nana and granddad didn't have a lot of money, they had a lot of mouths to feed and soup was cheap and easy to make when you've got a big family to look after. You put the soup pot on and it pretty much cooks itself. So that's pretty much what I do. And same thing with stew or a casserole, same deal. A little bit of meat, chop up your veggies, make up some gravy. Now, I always add a little bit of dry mustard to a casserole, to a beef casserole um, with the gravy. just adds a little bit of extra flavour. You can't actually taste it as mustard. It gives it that, I don't know, a bit of warmth perhaps. Just a bit of depth to the flavour. So throw in what you've got. If you've got parsnips or turnips, onions, carrots, celery, um, potatoes, pumpkin, sweet potato, whatever you've got. All those hard root veggies are really good for slow cooking in stews and casseroles. Into a pot, into the oven, put on low. I like to do them. I'm doing them in the oven. They're on about 160 with a lid on. And I just put them on at lunchtime. They're usually ready by tea time. Otherwise, they're going to slow cooker in the morning. And it's an easy dinner and it's cheap. Now, that one is really easy to stretch because you can have a soup ladle of the stew with some mashed potato and some um, cauliflower or broccoli or shredded cabbage or something like that on the side. You don't need a lot of the main savoury then. So it will stretch. So one one pot can often do two or three meals. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, says mm -hmm. Hannah. Didn't you know I did that? No, I did. I've oh, just you did. Done the sound oh. oh, she was doing sound effects. Did you all get the sound effects? How cute is that? Okay, so you know things like the quick rice patties are cheap. The bread fritters. <laughs> can't get much cheaper than that but french french toast or fried bread now i know we like to think that we eat healthfully and for the most part we do um, but sometimes you're in a rush or there really isn't a lot of money there's not a lot of food in the cupboard you're scratching to find something to eat or it's the weekend and you can't be bothered so fried bread i just we don't have dripping anymore. We don't have dripping in our house anymore. So I just butter the bread on both sides, heat the fry pan, um, put the bread in the fry pan, and then I get an egg ring, cut the middle out of the bread with the egg ring, take that piece out and pop it in the pan to cook too, crack an egg into the centre, and we have eggy bread. Flip it over once it started, the egg started to set, flip it over, and fry it, pretty much fry it on the other side. Now, I use non-stick pans, so a little bit of butter doesn't matter. Um, they don't stick. They're really easy. It's easy to clean. Everybody likes it. You can choose whether you're going to cook it long enough for the yolk to be hard or soft or medium, whatever. And then you've got your crunchy little crown that goes on top of the egg. Yummy. Eggy bread is really good. It's a cheap meal. Eggs are cheap protein. I know we moan and groan about the price of eggs, but eggs are a really good source of protein and they are really, as a source of protein, very, very inexpensive. So don't go past them. Now, I've got a book on our um, in the e-book section on our website called Everybody's Got to Eat Eggs. 
it's really good egg recipes, you know, because eggs really are eggs really are a good source of protein. And the um, Heart Foundation has lifted their limit on eggs now, so there was, a limit. there was a limit because of the cholesterol in the yolks um, and lots of people would have just egg whites and leave the yolk and all sorts of weird and wonderful things where I figure if you work hard and mm, anyway. What Pardon? What, what a waste. <laughs> but eggs are a really good source of protein and they are not expensive. They go a long way. Scrambled eggs, one egg and a tablespoon of milk. Is that right? Um, it's 10 mils of milk per egg. 10 mils of milk. So te two teaspoons of milk per egg for scrambled eggs. Whisk it up and put it into a cup and into the microwave for one minute. I do it for one minute and 30 seconds and I start to work. Yeah, so one minute and then, yeah, it will depend on your microwave. Our microwave, they're pretty good after one minute, so then just check it after that to see perfect scrambled eggs. They fluff up. That's so good. You don't have to worry about adding too much milk or water and then separating. Perfect. Perfect scrambled eggs. Um, Ooh, kale. No, we're not kale lovers, Yvonne. Sorry. I'm eating pasta, though. Mm, well, we probably don't know. Mm. No. Problem is, I don't grow it because I don't like it. Um, so I'm getting the... Over here, is it time? Nearly time. So look, there's lots of options for eating well when money is tight. You don't need to... Um, resort to two-minute noodles all the time. You don't need to um, live on plain boiled rice. There's all sorts of things. You just don't need to. If you've got your basics, follow a few things, think about what you're doing, shop once a week or once a fortnight, just shop once and use your grocery money wisely. If you're going to grow a few things, you can barter a few things, so you're freeing up more money in your grocery budget to get the essentials. It can be done, but you, you just need to want to do it. I can sit here and talk and talk and talk, as you know, until the cows come home, and that will be a long time because we don't have a cow, so he's got to get one and then he's got to come home. It'll be a long time. But unless you really want to do it, it won't happen for you. So just decide to do it. Just do it. Okay? Don't think about it. Just do it. Make your shopping list. Stick to it. If you've left something behind, then you need to go find my substitute list and see what you've got that's a substitute or look it up on Google or whatever. Find a substitute. Stick to it. Don't go over budget, and, but don't stress about it. Make it a game. Make it a challenge. If you've got older kids, give them a meal that they have to prepare using what you've got in the house or limit it to four ingredients. Let them do a four-ingredient meal and see what they come up with, you know. Now, it might just be scrambled eggs on toast or baked beans on toast. There's nothing wrong with that. They are still good, nutritious meals. It's just that we have, are inclined to think of those as snack-type meals rather than an actual meal meal. Or breakfast. Or a breakfast or a quick lunch, yes. But, it's you know, baked beans on toast, baked beans are really, really good for you. Relatively cheap, about 89 cents a can at Aldi. 65 no, 65 now. They've dropped the price at Aldi of baked beans and they're the good baked beans too. And the spaghetti. And the spaghetti, but there's not much nutrition in the spaghetti. But the baked beans are really good for you, full of fibre, full of potassium, lots of things in them. Baked beans are good. I add baked beans to my lasagna and spaghetti sauce. Mm -hmm. Whiz them in the food processor so they look a bit like the mince, mince you know, the little granules of mince, toss them in, stir it through, nobody knows. Stretches, it, stretches the meat really, really, really well. Adds bulk, but it adds nutrition to the dish too. Um, all right, now, um, Linky Family, for those who enjoy podcasts, there is an Australian podcast called Use It Up. It focuses on 
making delicious food using what is traditionally considered waste or scraps or and eliminating food waste. Cool. Um, you don't need to waste it. You just don't. But you don't need to stress about it. So you, know, you can eat really well on a really tight budget. You can raise three children and a husband on a really tight budget and they're all healthy. They're all reasonably happy. Um, there's only two things I've made that they don't like, salmon dish, has gone down in history. It's my most notorious mistake, the salmon dish, and um, salmon, grilled oh, salmon. No. <laughs> don't even did, touch it. They didn't appreciate it at all. Oh, don't know why you wasted the money. There you go. I enjoyed it. So, you know, you can still eat well on a tight budget if you have to. So it's time for me to go. I've definitely got the now. I shall see you next week. If you've enjoyed tonight's show, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. Um, I will go back and read your comments um, later on. If you haven't checked out our website, please go to cheapstatesclub.net mm -hmm. and have a look at it. And I'll be back next Tuesday. It's August already. Do you know what? Oh, my goodness. Do you think the year is going faster? I know we've got COVID-19 and lockdowns and travel limits and all sorts of things going on. My goodness, this year is flying past. I can't believe it's August already. It doesn't feel like it. It feels like I should still be back in March or April. All right. Good night, everyone. I shall see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye.